falls through the cracks of what God can defeat. There's nothing that falls through the cracks of what God is in control of. He is all-powerful. He makes all the decisions, and He loves you. And so that's what we want to spend our time this morning talking about. The first thing I want us to look at from this passage is this, is that God is on the believer's side. Now, I wanted to just write this and say, God is on our side, but I think there's an important distinction to put there, that God is on the believer's side. And throughout this passage, you see Paul say the same thing. He doesn't say that all humans are protected by him. He says his children are protected by him. He doesn't say that everybody that walks the earth has his providence. He says everybody that is his child has his providence. And so you see one of the disclaimers, one of the pre by God, for being protected by God, is that we need to be followers of God. And if you're a believer in Christ, if you've accepted Christ as your Savior, and you believe that you're a sinner, and that you confess that He is what you need for salvation and nothing else, He is on your side. And I want to be very clear, that's the only prerequisite to Him being on your side. It's not how good you are. It's not how often you come to the offering plate. All of those things are in to how much you love Christ. But for you to have God on your side, you just have to be a believer, a follower of him. Someone who follows what he tells you to do. Someone who is a Christian. So God is on the side of the believers. He's on the believer's side. First thing we understand about that is that he gave Jesus for our sin. Here's the evidence. You want to know some true evidence of how much God loves us and how much he's on our side? He, even in this passage, the way Paul says it is this. He says, he gave his only son for you. And I think that it's important to note that in, in, in uh, Romans 5.8, he also says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So I, I, I used to tell it to teens this way. I think this is really powerful. It impacts me. It convinces me. Not only did God love you so much that he sent Jesus to die for your sin. I want you to think about it this way. Before he ever created you, he knew that you would cost Jesus Christ. Have you ever thought about that? Before he ever put breath in your lungs, before he ever put you into existence, he knew how much you would cost, and he still created you. Think about that. That you were going to cost Jesus Christ, and he loved you so much that he created you anyway. That's a love that surpasses anything that you'll encounter here on earth. Because even the greatest of man, that, let's say it this way, even if I was going to give one of my daughters for your life, if I had the choice for you to never exist or to have to give up one of them, the choice is pretty easy. There's no chance that I'm going to give one of my daughters so that you have an opportunity to live. But that's what Christ did. That's exactly what he did. He knew that we would fall. He knew that we would sin. And even while we were yet sinners, Jesus came and died for our sins. Now, if you have trouble and you say, well, I don't know if God's going to provide for my rent. I don't know if God's going to provide for my financial needs. I don't know if he's going to provide for my emotional needs. I don't know if he's going to provide for my physical needs. All you need to do is come back to this passage and remember that even while you were a sinner, even while you were as low as you've ever been, God gave Jesus Christ for you. Which leads right next to in our next thought. If he gave Jesus for us, and this is what the passage says, if we look at verse number 32, he says... He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all. Listen to the reasoning. How will he not also with him freely give us all things? Here's the, here's the question. What is there that Christ, that God would withhold from us if he's willing to give Christ his son for us? There's nothing. There's nothing that he would withhold from us if it was for our good. So here's where faith comes into play. Because often you say, well, I prayed for something and God didn't answer this prayer. And so I either, maybe he just doesn't love me or maybe I just didn't pray hard enough or maybe I just fill in the blank. You, you start to reason with human reasoning. Why would God not give me what I want? But the problem with that is faith to know that God knows what we actually need. Right? I used this example before, but I want to give it to you again. My daughters, Lily, when she was just two, we used to take her to SeaWorld probably once a month. And every time we'd get in the car to go to SeaWorld, we would get about five minutes down the road, and she would start to say, can we stop? She'd see a Walmart on the side of the highway and say, let's just go to Walmart today. I don't want to drive any further. Now, I knew as a father, 
Even though she was asking to go to Walmart, that wasn't the best thing for her. I knew that she would much rather go to SeaWorld, that she'd have a better time at SeaWorld, that there were more things for her at SeaWorld, and so I wanted to take her to SeaWorld. But if I would have just gave her what she was asking for, it would have been far inferior to what I planned to bless her with. Have you ever considered that God does the same thing with us? If he gave us exactly what we asked for, it would be inferior to his plan for us. If he, if he gave us what we asked for, he couldn't possibly love us as much as he does because knowing what's best for us, giving us what's not best for us, that's not a good parent, right? My daughters would eat cotton candy three meals a day, 365 days a year if I allowed that. And they ask for it too. So you, by that logic, I should feed my daughters cotton candy every day if I really love them. No, that's not true. In fact, I might have to run into some problems with foster care system. They might be not in my house anymore if all I ever fed them was, was cotton candy. Because even though that's what they want, I know that's not what's best for them. The same thing's true about God. Even though we may beg for things that we definitely think we want in our lives, He understands more than we understand. He knows more than we know. And we have to understand this, that there's nothing that he would withhold from us if it was in our best interests, if it was the best thing for us, if it was within his will. And so that's where when we pray, a true faithful Christian prays, and you always say, if it's your will, God. Because I understand through years of life and the years I've been a Christian that too many times what I want is so far inferior to what his plan is. And so having the faith to say, God, whatever it is that you have planned for my life is what I want for my life. That's when we start to understand that Christ isn't withholding something from us because we didn't try hard enough. God's not withholding something from us because we're not good enough. God's not withholding something from us because he doesn't love us. God may be holding things back from us that are less than his best for us. And we've got to have faith understanding that that's his will. It takes faith to do that. The third thing I want us to understand here is this, that he intercedes for us. So to really understand how much God loves us and how much he's on our side, we need to know that he is constantly making intercession for us. Or in other words, he's stepping in on our behalf. That word intercedes is not something we necessarily use all the time. So I want you to get this mental picture. There's a fight between you and Satan. And God, the Father, is stepping in between and protecting you. That's intercession. That's him interceding on our behalf. Now, there's legal implications here too. The word intercedes is that he is stepping in to pay the cost that we can't pay. So we need to understand that God loves us so much that he sent Jesus Christ for our sins. God loves us so much that there's nothing he'll withhold from us. And God loves us so much that he's actively stepping in on our behalf. Listen, there's nothing that happens in your life that's a mystery to God. There's nothing that happens in your life that surprises God. There's nothing that's going on in your life right this moment that God doesn't know about. And I'll take it a step further. There's nothing that's going on in your life that God is not right there with you in. He knows what you're feeling. He knows what you're facing. And those of you that are parents or that have, um, even have younger siblings or you have somebody in your life that you love, you know when the people that you love are hurting you hurt worse than they do. I never understood that until I was a dad. I'll be honest with you. I could never understand that until I was a dad. But the first time I can remember Lily getting sick. Now, I'm not going to tell you the story because we're in church and it's gross. And so I won't. I have you as a captive audience. I don't think that's fair. But let's just say we were at the zoo and she was not feeling good. It was not a good zoo day for Lily. I can remember earnestly praying, God, please let me be sick so she'll stop being sick. That's a father's love. And those of you that have children understand that. When your kids are going through something, I can remember when my daughter had to have a surgery, she had to have her tonsils out. I can remember thinking, God, I'm bigger and stronger. Let me take this pain for her. You know why that's there? Because we're made in the image of Christ. I want you to understand something. There's nothing in your life that you're facing that God is not feeling as much as you are. He is sympathizing and empathizing with you because he loves us so much more than I even love my daughters. He doesn't want us to go through anything. And I'll tell you this, if you're going through something difficult, it's absolutely necessary or he wouldn't allow it to happen. 
That's the truth of the matter. That's how we are built. We are built in the image of Christ. And I know as a father that if my daughters are facing something that's difficult, for example, my daughters will go and I don't think any of them have to get shots this week. That would be a good fun way to tell them that they have shots this week if I just told them from the pulpit, like, you're going Wednesday, you're getting 12 shots, enjoy. But when they go and get shots, if there was any other way to protect them from the things that those shots are protecting them from, I would not let them take those shots. But as a dad, as a parent, I understand that those immunizations are important for them and it will save them from greater pain later on. Same thing's true about God. In your life, there are going to be things that hurt. But I want you to understand this. If it wasn't necessary, it wouldn't be there. God's not ignoring you. God's not oblivious to what you're going through. He loves you, and he's taking care of you. So first thing we've got to understand is this, that God is on the believer's side. The second thing we need to understand is this, is that he is in control. (coughs) So I've said this often, and I truly believe this. If these two things are absolute truth in your life, it'll change the way you see everything else. These first two points. If you truly believe that God is on your side, and you truly believe that God is in control, what is there in life that should terrify you? So what Paul's talking about here. He's going to talk about it in the passage. What is there in life that should depress you, that should frustrate you? What is there in life that has any chance to defeat you if God is in control and he's on your side? The answer is there's nothing. And Paul's going to tell us that just here in a minute. He's going to tell us in no uncertain terms that there is nothing that you're going to face That's greater than the love of God. That's going to separate you from the love of God. But the thing we need to understand here is this, is that God is in control. Look at verse number 33 with me. The Bible says this, Who will bring a charge against God's elect? Listen to this. God is the one who justifies. First thing, He is the justifier. You want to know what that word justifier means? If you understand justify, it means to be right with God. Okay, so to be declared right with God, I am justified, means that I am right with God. Or in other words, uh, I want you to think about this. This kind of gives you, if you're you're a visual person like me, when you're typing a document and it's all the way on the left side, that's left justified, right? The, the, The first line is the same for all of those characters, all right? And if you go on the right, if you're right justified, the first line is the same for all those. The point is this, that all of those things are lining up. Or in other words, they're at one. Another word for this is they're reconciled. They're in line with one another. And so here's what the Bible says, that God justifies you. Or in other words, he puts you right in line with God. Jesus Christ justifies you by putting you right in line with where God wants you to be. That's what he's saying here. When we are justified, what that means is that we are declared innocent in the eyes of God. You see how that becomes important. And he goes on further. He wants you to be very clear because the fear in these people was that, well, maybe somebody, maybe some religious leader is going to see that I didn't fulfill some task or I didn't do um, some religious rite the way that I was supposed to. Or or maybe in our terms, we say, well, I don't know if I prayed the right prayer. I don't know if I said the right words. or I don't know if I went to church enough times. Here's what he's saying. That's not the decider. says that who's going to lay a charge at God's elect because God is the one who justifies. Jesus is the one who justifies. He goes on further. Not only is he the justifier, he's also the judge. We go on further in verse number 33. He says, who can bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Verse 34, he goes on and says, who is the one who condemns? Who is the one who condemns? The answer, Christ Jesus is, who died for us. Yes, rather, who was raised, who's at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Here's what he's saying. He says, God is the one that can declare you innocent. Then he goes on, he says, who is he that condemns? Or in other, ones, in other words, who is the one that declares somebody guilty? Here's what he says, Jesus Christ is the one who declares somebody guilty or innocent. He says, the power of guilt and innocence is in the hands of God our Father. It's in the hands of Jesus Christ who also intercedes for you. He draws our remembrance back. Who also died for your sins. So here's what he's saying. There is nothing in life that is going to make you less than. Right? There's nothing in life that makes you inferior. There's nothing in life that should drive you to fear. There's no one in life that has judgment over you or has power over you or is a slave owner over you. There's nothing 
in life that has power over you other than Jesus Christ and God the Father. And when we go back to the first point, he's on our side. So I want you to think about this. It's as if you walked into the courtroom and you'd gotten a speeding ticket. I've never had one of those, so I'm just going to have to... I'm lying. I just lied. See, even the pastor lies. I have. I have had one of those. Let's imagine you got a speeding ticket. You walk into the courtroom, and the judge just automatically says, I like you, and I have the power to free you, and, and I love you, so you don't have to pay the ticket. You feel pretty good about the ticket, right? Now, I, I would question whether that judge is very honest or good, but in this situation, Jesus came, and not only did he love us, and does he want the best for us, he took our punishment. It's as if that judge said, I like you enough that you are guilty, and I'm going to pay your ticket. Let me tell you, I've never had that happen. I'm, I'm waiting for the day, but I've never had that happen, except for with Jesus Christ. He said, listen, you are guilty. You have done these things. I am the one that has to declare you guilty or innocent. But listen, I'm dying in your place, and so I'm declaring you eternally innocent. You are justified with God because of me. That's what Jesus says. And so here we have to understand that God is in control. He's in control so far beyond our imagination that we can't even comprehend the things that he's controlling. We can't even, uh, we can't even understand how much he is doing to orchestrate our lives in the way that he wants them to go and that how much he controls them. The third thing is this. He is an overwhelming conqueror. He's the overwhelming conqueror. Verse 37, it says it this way. But in all these things... We overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us, Jesus Christ. That was, our, that was our example this morning with the kids. Listen, if you're not in the bulldozer, if you're not in Jesus Christ, you can forget about winning, right? You can forget about even competing. You can forget about even being close. Listen, I was trying to be nice and let those kids push me a little, but their strength was less than mine. And that's not even a good example because the strength of Satan compared to our human ability is no match. We have no chance. But when we're in Christ Jesus, Satan has no chance. When we're in Christ Jesus, our enemies are the ones shaking, not us. When we are in Christ Jesus, we become overwhelming conquerors. But that's the only way. That's the only way we can. And so we understand here that God is on our side. And not only is God on our side, God is in control. And we see that both legally, both uh, over power and over dominion, both in physical ways. God is in control of everything that we're going to face. And he's on your side. So then Paul goes on to say this. Here's the conclusion he draws, and it's the same conclusion we must draw. If that God is on our side and God is in control, here's the things that can't touch us. And I love this list. We've got a long list. I'll go quickly on them. But I want to make sure you understand what Paul's really saying here. Because sometimes we read down through this, and the third thing is this. Nothing can separate us from his love. So here's that list. Here's a giant list that's coming up on the screen. There are a lot, but I want to make sure you understand and can follow along. And don't just say, well, here's a list of things that God's protecting us from. Because here's what Paul's really saying. First thing he says is tribulation. Do you understand that tribulation is oppression or affliction? It's pressure. Have you, how many of you have ever experienced pressure in life? I have. Stress. We call it stress. Sometimes we say it this way. Someone will say, how are you doing? And you'll say, I'm just tired. How many of you have caught yourself, that's the only way you respond when someone says, hey, how are you doing? I'm tired. I'm really tired. You know what you're really saying? I'm stressed out. There's pressure. I'm oppressed. I'm afflicted. There's things in my life that are pushing me from every side. Let me give you an example. So many times we think in life that it should be the big things, right? So, so I, I read a comic strip lately that, uh, recently that said, when I was a kid, I thought that quicksand was going to be a much bigger problem than it really is in adult life, right? If you think about it, every, every, every problem in a comic strip or in a cartoon is like an alien or a robot or a quicksand, something big and troublesome. But the reason our kids can't understand what pressure is about is because it's not one thing. Right? When we go through life, it's this bill and that responsibility and this person and this other thing. And before you know it, you're juggling a thousand things. And when someone says, how are you doing? I'm just tired. I'm just tired. I'm just, I don't know. I'm just worn out. Here's why. There's pressure on every side. Here's what the Bible says. You can have victory over that. You can overwhelmingly conquer that. That tribulation, that pressure on every side, Christ wants to take that from you. You know how that happens? Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
You know when you're going to conquer that? When you are in Christ, when you're in the bulldozer, when he becomes number one in your life. Next thing he says is distress. Being closed in in dire calamity. Listen, this is, this is that, that time that you get the call from the bill collector and you looked, at your, you looked at your bank account and there's nothing in there. And you're saying, this is a dire calamity. <laughs> uh, power is going out or I am paying and there's nothing to pay with. I, I, you've been there. And maybe it's not that exact situation, but where there's no way out, you're closed in. You don't have any options left. You know what the Bible says? You're overwhelmingly conquering that if you're in Christ Jesus. He wants to do it. Listen, I, I, I used to struggle with that. I can remember as a young person thinking, uh, listen, this is a funny story. I can remember as a college student, I went to Trinity Baptist College where Miles is now, so um, pray for him, by the way. He's still there over the summer, and he's 22, so <laughs> life is hard for him. But anyhow, I can remember being at college, and I can remember this prayer, praying this prayer multiple times, probably more times than I care to admit. Waking up in the morning, realizing I was wearing either my last clean shirt or my last clean pants or my last clean whatever and looking in my quarter pile, right? You got to go do laundry and you got to go to the laundry mat or you got to go to the laundry room and there was like one quarter left. And I can remember that being the most stressful thing for a young single guy looking to get my, 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 uh, not only my degree but also my wife in college. That was like the worst. I, I can remember praying, God, if you don't give me quarters today, I'm going to stink tomorrow. I'll never get married. I could never be a pastor because I stink and it's because I have no quarters. So God, please provide quarters. Now, I wish I could tell you that I had the faith to just wait and allow God to provide for me in whatever way he was. But that prayer usually followed by 15 minutes later calling my dad and saying, Dad, I got no quarters. I need you to put money in my account so I can go get a roll of quarters. Now, there were a couple times where I said, God, I don't know what you're going to do and you say, well, it's just quarters. Who cares about quarters? In my life, in that moment, that was dire calamity. I had no options. Nobody was washing my clothes for me. I can remember coming home from work one day, and one of my roommates had gone and washed all my clothes. Now, one thing, that's creepy. But secondly, God answered prayer, right? God gave me what I needed when I had no options. And, and that friend, when I said, why did you do that? Because at first I was kind of like, why are you touching my stuff? You're, you're kind of gross. Like, why did you do that? He said, I don't know. I just felt like God wanted me to do it. And it occurred to me, why am I judging the way that God answered my prayers? And some of you experienced that same thing. Maybe you got home and you said, man, I don't know how we're going to pay this bill. I don't know how we're going to pay this, uh, this, this, this hospital bill. I don't know how we're going to get through the month. Or maybe it's, I don't know how this family situation is going to be resolved. I don't know how this situation at work is going to be resolved. And God just stepped in and changed everything and took care of you in a way that you never even imagined was possible and reminded you that he doesn't need you to answer your problems. Let me tell you something. When you're in dire calamity, when you're in distress, God is overwhelmingly conquering. Persecution. We all understand that. And listen, we don't get much of it in America right now, but we may not be many years from it. If you go to a third world country, you go to a country where, where there is no freedom of religion. Anthony was just in the Bahamas, and that was probably more freedom there. There he is. I'm looking all over. He's in the back videoing. There's more freedom there than in a lot of countries, but still, there is a very real sense that you are in danger if you're spreading the gospel. That's called persecution. We don't face a lot, but you know what? We've got to be willing to go up to somebody, and even if it offends them, be willing to share our faith. Now, I did not just say go and intentionally offend them. Don't go try to step on their toes on purpose. But the gospel is offensive to those that are in sin. The Bible tells us it will be. Persecution. Next thing he says is human needs. He gives us two of them. He says famine and nakedness. What that means is I got new, no food and I got no stuff. You know what? You're overwhelmingly conquering that through Jesus Christ. Listen, I, I, I used to tell teenagers all the time, and this is the truth, when summer hits, something strikes in me that I have a immense need for lemonade. I don't know if you're the same way. I'm a seasonal person, so when it's Christmas, it's eggnog. When it's summer, it's lemonade. And I always like romanticize this perfect glass of lemonade, right? Like you've seen it on the commercial. The glass is like dripping. The sweat is going down the glass. The condensation its just perfect. There's lemons inside, maybe some strawberries. And you just know if I drank that lemonade, I would never be thirsty again. That lemonade, that perfect lemonade. I used to tell the story so many times that one time a teenager came in with a giant mason jar of homemade lemonade and said, this is the perfect lemonade. 
I, I hated to tell her it wasn't, but anyway. <laughs> Here's the reality, though. There is no perfect lemonade, right? There is no perfect physical thing that you're going to be able to fill the void of your life. In fact, through life, so many of us, that's why there's so much trouble with drug addiction and alcoholism. It's not because the, the, the substances, the substances have been there. The reason they're there is because people are trying to fill a void with something that never will. Alcohol will never fill that void. Tobacco will never fill that void. Drugs will never fill that void. And regardless of what you try, whether it's the perfect lemonade or whether it's uh, the perfect bottle of beer, whatever it is you think that's going to fill that void, it will always leave you feeling unsatisfied. There will always be a hole. There will always be something there that is not fulfilled because what is going to fulfill that is Jesus Christ. Now, He provides for our human needs, but also He helps us realize we don't need everything we thought we needed. Right? Some of us struggle from the, the, the too much is never enough anxiety, uh, uh, problem, right? So, so maybe it's, if you're a gadget person like me, you got a new phone and the new one comes out and you're like, well, it can do this and that. And I like this thing and I want it to be able to do that. Or maybe it's clothes and you say, well, you know, I really, I only have 27 pairs of shoes. Leah's laughing because I just described two things that are, <laughs> that are my problem. <laughs> but the point is this, if that security is coming from physical things, it's never going to fulfill you. There will never be enough money in the bank. I There'll never be enough gas in the tank. There'll never be perfect lemonade. There'll never be enough alcohol to fulfill what you're trying to fulfill. Because you're only going to conquer it through Jesus Christ our Lord. He goes on further. He says peril and sword. That's danger and violence. We understand those things. He goes on and says death and life. All these things cannot separate us from the love of God. He goes on further. I want you to understand when he says death here, we need to understand that even dying is not the end for the believer. It's just part of the process. Next slide says this that not only um, angels and principalities, this is supernatural beings. These are things we don't even see. Here's what the Bible says. God is interceding in such a way that even things you don't comprehend and can't see are being defeated for your cause when you're in Christ Jesus. Have you ever lived a week of your life where you felt like, man, everything is just coming against you? The car breaks down, uh, so everybody's mad at you, nothing's working at, the, at your job, everything just seems to be falling apart. Do you ever consider that Satan is fighting against you? And if you're not living and following Christ, maybe he just isn't stepping in on some of those things. Maybe he's helping you realize that you can't win by yourself. Maybe he's reminding you that you're only a conqueror when you're in him. You can't push by yourself. He goes on further. He says things present. That's what we face today. He says things to come. What we'll face tomorrow. He says powers. That covers political, physical, military, supernatural. That's all the powers of the world. And he goes on finally. He says, nor height, nor depth. And the last thing he says is, nor any other created thing. Here's what he's saying. There is nothing that you will face on earth that has the ability to separate you from the love of God. Here's the perspective you've got to keep. God is on your side and God is in control. And if those two things will stay as the two guide stones of your life, the cornerstones of everything you believe must be that God is on your side and that God is in control, then none of the rest of this can phase you. None of the rest of this can stand against you. God loves you and he's in control. Let's stand together as we pray. God, we love so much. Love us. heart, God, but that you are orchestrating who are